Hi, I'm Dr. Brett Carroll. Today we're going to be talking about the initial evaluation of, of aortic aneurysms. I have no disclosures. So a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today includes the spectrum of aortic aneurysms, what are the risk factors for the development of aortic aneurysms, and who may be appropriate, who are particularly high-risk patients that should be screened for aortic aneurysms, and what is that initial clinical evaluation that should be performed when you see a new patient with an aneurysm uh, in your office. So simply, what is an aneurysm? It's the full thickness dilation of an artery, which includes the intima, media, and adventitia, and is enlarged to greater than 50% of what would be the expected normal diameter. The normal diameter varies with age, gender, body habitus, and location within the aorta. So a simple uh, schema of the aorta includes uh, here, coming out from the heart, the aortic root, with the sinuses of Valsalva extending here with the transition into the ascending aorta with the sinotubular junction. You have the aortic arch with uh, three branches for most patients, including the brachiocephalic, left common carotid, and the left subclavian artery. After the left subclavian artery, you have the descending portion of the aorta. The aorta normal diameter will taper as you get more distal, and as you cross the diaphragm, will become the abdominal aortic, uh, the abdominal aorta with the suprarenal, pararenal, and infrarenal segments before branching into the iliac arteries uh, bilaterally. So in terms of risk factors for aortic disease, uh, specifically um, age is high regardless if it's in the abdomen or in the ascending arch or descending. Atherosclerosis, hypertension, smoking, and hyperlipidemia are also associated risk factors. When speaking of the ascending arch and descending aneurysms, connective tissue disorders uh, may be prevalent, including Marfan syndrome, Lois Dietz syndrome, and vascular Ehlers Danlos syndrome. A family history of thoracic aortic aneurysm is also not uncommon and may be associated with a syndrome called FTAAD, or familial thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection. Those are patients with specific genetic mutations that put them at a higher risk for the development of an aneurysm without other features of a connective tissue disorder. Bicuspid aortic valves are also frequently associated with ascending arch and descending aneurysms, more so of the aortic root uh, or the mid-ascending aneurysm. And more rarely, but uh, not uncommon, is an inflammatory disorder such as Bichette syndrome or uh, giant cell arteritis. Abdominal aortic aneurysms more frequently associated with traditional risk factors of atherosclerosis, including age, male gender, cigarette smoking is highly correlated, hypertension, family history of a AAA, and other aneurysms outside of uh, the aorta, including popliteal or iliac artery aneurysms. So in terms of screening, when it comes to uh, ascending arch or descending aneurysms, they're almost always asymptomatic and are found incidentally on imaging. Patients where you would consider a further evaluation for an aneurysm would be those with a known bicuspid aortic valve, those with a connective tissue disorder, or those with a family history of an aneurysm or a dissection where you're concerned that there's a high probability for a genetic component. In terms of uh, AAA screening, uh, these are more well-defined. And in terms of Medicare payment, it would be done for those patients um, that are male, 65 to 75 years old, who have ever smoked. Uh, some consider greater than 100 cigarettes as being the threshold. Men or women with a family history of a AAA. And you could consider screening, uh, although it may not be covered by insurance, in women 65 to 75 who have ever smoked or uh, those that are otherwise high risk, uh, for example, those with a high burden of atherosclerosis. In terms of the clinical evaluation, when you're seeing someone for the first time with a new diagnosis of aortic aneurysms, and you're trying to figure out what is the underlying etiology to that aneurysm, you start by assessing what is their traditional risk factors. Are they older age? Are they male? Do they have atherosclerosis? Do they have hypertension? Those are more likely to be sporadic or degenerative in nature. If they don't have those family risk, uh, excuse me, those traditional risk factors, we want to consider do they have a strong family history or do they have inflammatory symptoms? Although this is quite rare, it's not something you want to miss as it would uh, be a completely different pathway in terms of treatment and a focus on anti-inflammatories. If they do have a strong family history, you want to consider do they have a bicuspid aortic valve? Do they have syndromic features with a connective tissue disorder, which we'll speak about uh, in a moment? 
or do they have otherwise no features of a, a syndrome but have a very strong family history and you're worried about a clear mutation that may be driving their presentation? In terms of uh, the assessment, when you see them in clinic, when obtaining the history, you wanna see, do they have any symptoms? It's quite rare to have symptoms in the chronic setting of a ascending or thoracic uh, descending uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, but they would include a chest or back pain. Rarely, if they're large enough, will they call, cause dysphagia, um, but usually those are uh, a strong indication for repair. Uh, other associated symptoms would be a, uh, or conditions would be a prior history of an aneurysm or dissection elsewhere in the body. And again, a strong family history, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. In terms of other uh, important features in the review systems are, do they have easy bruising? Do they have a lens dislocation in the past, which can be associated uh, with Marfans? Do they have severe myopia again with Marfans? Do they have a history of repair cleft palate that may not be obvious always on exam, so it's important to ask? Do they have a history of spontaneous pneumothorax? Do they have vet known valvular disease? Do they have multiple prior joint subluxation? Uh, so dislocated joints with relatively mild trauma. Have they ever had an intestine or uterine rupture? Do they have hypermobility, particularly of the small joints of the wrists and fingers? Premature osteoarthritis, kind of out of proportion to what would be expected for their, for their age uh, and weight. Have they had a relatively low risk ruptured tendon? And do they have a history of uh, repaired club feet. All of these are associated with connective tissue disorder, primarily Marfan, but also Ehlers-Danlos and Lois Dietz. In terms of the physical exam features that you want to look out for, do they have a thin face or nose? Do they have prominent eyes, hypertelarism, downward slanting palpebral fissures, lobeless or low set ears, malar hypoplasia, so low set cheekbones, retronathia, bifid uvula is seen in uh, Lois Dietz, high arch palate or dental crowding not infrequently seen in Marfans. There are other criteria like the Ghent criteria which gives a scoring system where you incorporate a lot of these physical exam findings and historical features into a score that helps predict the likelihood a patient may have a connective tissue disorder. It's important to do this head to toe assessment although now with the frequency of genetic testing which we'll talk about uh, it's a little bit easier to pin down if a, a particular mutation is present. So in terms of uh, below the head exam, do they have a, a chest wall deformity, including a pectus excavatum or carinatum? Do they have uh, valvular disease on auscultation, including an ejection uh, click, which can be seen with bicuspid aortic valve, or a mid systolic click of mitral valve prolapse? Do they have reduced elbow extension, which is seen in Marfans or scoliosis kyphosis? Wrist or thumb sign, I mentioned the Ghent criteria. This is uh, a scoring system uh, where they incorporate uh, sclerodactyly with very long fingers and otherwise thin limbs. So uh, a patient, can they overlap their pinky and thumb across their wrist? Can they stick their thumb out the side of their uh, enclosed fist, uh, which would be, uh, again, consistent with sclerodactyly, very long fingers. Do they have striae? Do they have thin skin or prominent venous pattern, which can be seen with Ehlers-Danlos vascular type, atrophic scars, or acrogaria, which is the premature uh, aging of their skin of their hands in particular? Do they have a relatively small torso compared to their height? Uh, that can be consistent with uh, Marfan's as can an increased arm span. And again, there's a calculator online which can be utilized to narrow down those numbers to see if that's an abnormal ratio. Do they have hind foot valgus, which is a medial deviation uh, of the hind foot, or pes planus, do they have uh, a flat feet? In terms of the discussion regarding genetic testing, uh, a fair amount of these patients will have uh, a underlying genetic predisposition. It's estimated anywhere from eight to 10% of patients with uh, an aneurysm and even higher in those with more severe manifestations like uh, an aortic dissection may have an underlying familial component. So a strong family history uh, assessment when they're in clinic is important. This includes not just, does anyone in your family have a history of aneurysms? It's more specific going by generation. Has anyone died, certainly of a known aneurysm or dissection, but has anyone died Suddenly, a lot of patients say, oh, um, my father had a heart attack when he was 50, and then you drill down into the details, and they really just died suddenly at 50, never had an autopsy, was never seen at the hospital. That's concerning for sudden death due to an aortic catastrophe. Is the patient presenting at a relatively young age? Do they not have other risk factors or clear etiologies for their aneurysm uh, that would make you think that maybe there's a genetic uh, component driving this? There are multiple commercial vendors now available. You can send specific genes if you are worried about a particular syndrome based on their history exam or if they have a family member with a known specific genetic defect that you're looking for that uh, particular mutation. Uh, you can also send a panel if it's not as clear what the patient may have uh, from a genetic component under, uh, underlying this process.
There are limitations. You know, obviously we are not aware of all the genetic defects that can cause thoracic aneurysmal disease. So although it may be helpful if positive, uh, frequently we're getting back variants of unknown significance, meaning it doesn't appear completely normal, though we're not sure if that mutation is associated with uh, aneurysm. And also, they, it may come back negative, but because of a strong family history, you have to treat the patient as if they have a, a familial thoracic syndrome. You have to discuss what is the implication for the patient. Will this change management based on a positive or negative value? And how will it uh, change family members? Does it reflect how they will change screening in the future? Uh, and now it's important to, to think of if a patient's family member is then screened with genetic testing and found to be positive, they now have a disease that can be um, utilized when undergoing disability insurance coverage or life insurance coverage. So just things to think about. I rarely do genetic testing the first time I see a patient. Often we bring it up and have them go discuss with their family members in, in return for on a subsequent visit to discuss further. So in conclusion, uh, it's important that we screen patients that are high risk. We mentioned those uh, that are be being covered by Medicare, particularly AAAs and others with associated syndromes that have a high prevalence of aneurysm. A head to toe evaluation for the underlying etiology when you first see a patient and the discussion of limitation benefits of genetic testing. So that's the initial evaluation of a patient with a new aneurysm. We'll discuss further in subsequent uh, presentations about the management of such patients.